Welcome to the Physician Pharmacist Podcast, a show designed to shed some light on a very unusual pathway into medicine. I'm your host, Nathan Gartland. I'm a licensed pharmacist and second year medical student. I'm also the author of PharmD to MD and the owner of the Physician Pharmacist Company. Most pharmacy students and professional graduates are aware of the possibility of going to medical school, but very few actually take the leap. We are here to unpack some of these details and open your eyes to the possibility of a career in both pharmacy and medicine. In today's show, we will be briefly cover medical school life, but primarily focus on topics relating to post-medical residency training. This will include the resident lifestyle, balancing work and personal time, a brief overview of general surgery, as well as the USMLE Step 3 exam. We will finish out by introducing advanced surgical fellowship training, and lastly, life as an attending. I'm very excited for our fifth episode of the Physician Pharmacist Podcast mini-series, where we will be interviewing Dr. Thomas Melvin. Dr. Melvin received his pharmacy doctorate from Duquesne University in 2013. Upon graduation, he immediately matriculated into the Marshall University School of Medicine in West Virginia and completed his education in 2017. He is currently in his fifth and final year of general surgery residency in Pennsylvania, where he serves as one of the chief surgical residents. Upon graduation, he plans to undergo a two-year fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery and subsequently become an attending. Thanks for being with us today, Dr. Melvin, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nathan. Um, uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Well, uh, based off of that background that I just gave, um, you know, let's start out with a few general questions to unpack some of that information. So it probably feels like a lifetime ago, but um, how did you get started with pharmacy in the first place? Uh, Yeah, that's an interesting question. I was uh, an undergraduate student uh, finishing up a degree in biology, and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. Um, I was curious just about just about everything. And a friend of mine brought up pharmacy and we researched at the last minute and applied to pharmacy school at the last minute, kind of on a whim. Um, And uh, it was a. Uh, pleasant surprise because I, I knew I loved the application of science. So probably pharmacy school, medical school, veterinary school, dental school, any of those type of professional schools would have worked for me. Um, and, uh, and I ended up falling in love with pharmacy. So I, I don't regret the, the decision at all. Wonderful. And I, I as well. Um, and so I, the next question, I guess, was going to be, you know, was medical school always one of your plans? And how did you transition into that particular, you know, how did that mindset shift from pharmacy into medicine? Uh, No, not at all. Um, It was kind of the opposite. I had rolled out medical school. Um, I had a a family friend who I was interested, or I was introduced to um, early on in my undergraduate education and kind of deterred me away from medical school. Uh, So I never really thought about it after that. Um, It wasn't, until I was in pharmacy school, where I was initially exposed to clinical pharmacy and then kind of hospital pharmacy and then medicine, um, that I had a like a robust exposure to the field of medicine. And then one of my pharmacy mentors asked me if I wanted to um, observe a surgery, which I've never seen before. And I took him up on the opportunity and um, and I thought to myself, wow, this is really what I want to do. Um, I was probably in my late second year of pharmacy school um, where I was first exposed. So I wasn't interested in medicine probably until about that time. Yeah, that's what a lot of the guests on the show have been saying as well as as we transition into that more clinical based pharmacy period of time, you know, later in the education process, we start to see how physicians and residents and how the, the, the whole healthcare team interacts with each other. But that's awesome that you got to, to see the OR and because that's something I personally haven't even seen yet. I'm actually starting uh, surgical rotations to, um, in a couple of weeks, or I guess a couple of months. Um, but that's my first set of uh, third year rotations, so I'm, I'm very looking forward to that quite a bit. Oh, that's great! Alrighty, so I recognize that you know it's been some time since your medical school application period, and the process has already cha- changed dramatically over that time period. You know, what was that like for you, and how did you handle it during pharmacy school? I do remember this, and it was difficult. Um, I was on um, some clinical rotations in pharmacy school um, in some areas that I was highly interested in because I was still pondering on whether or not I wanted to pursue clinical pharmacy as a career. So 
um, you know, I was, you know, working hard and um, at the same time, you know, studying for the MCAT um, and, you know, to balance those two things was not easy. Um, but, you know, like anything in life uh, that's worth doing, um, you know, you'll, you'll find a way to do it. And, uh, and that's probably um, what most of us would do. So um, it wasn't easy, but um, cer certainly doable. Exactly. And you kind of just have to put your head down and push through uh, with some exactly. of it. But if it's something you're super passionate about, then it, it kind of works itself out regardless. Um, and, you know, to, to kind of accelerate through this, while in medical school, how, how did your pharmacy education help with your academic and clinical success? I'd say it helped tremendously. Um, not only, I mean, I've, everybody knows in pharmacy school, you, you learn uh, not only, um, you know, therapeutics and pharmaceutics and pharmacokinetics, but you have a, you get a very deep depth understanding of, of physiology, um, which really helps you in medical school. And, um, and you learn the physiology again, in medical school, and you learn the pharmacology again in medical school. So it provides an extra layer. Um, so your, um, general understanding of most of these topics is, is very robust, I would say, compared to the traditional medical student. Um, yeah. In terms of clinical clinical success too, I mean, you've you've already been exposed to a hospital environment. You have worked with clinical pharmacists, so a lot of these things aren't new to you. So um, yeah, it definitely helps in both of those aspects. I would say. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that because just within the first two years of school, I still haven't you know transitioned to rotations quite yet, but I've utilized you know extensive pharmacy knowledge, um, and a lot of my education has been very helpful. A lot of my my peers are frustrated with me because I have this unique background. Um, but um, I am looking forward to to rotations. I think that's going to be a great opportunity to to really, I guess, utilize that that background even more so than just on standardized tests. So something I'm I'm really looking forward to. But kind of carrying through that with that question, you know, I found it when I found out that you were a PharmD turned surgeon. I was very curious to learn how you chose this field. You mentioned your OR experience a little bit um, and how that first you know exposed you to, I guess, the idea of going into medicine. But, you know, as a layman, I initially thought that you had chosen a field that uses very little pharmacy. And I, I'm just curious to know how you came to that realization that there is a lot of pharmacy still involved in a surgical specialty. Yeah, this was actually important to me when I was um, looking at different fields of medicine. I didn't want to completely, you know, waste my pharmacy education because I worked hard to get it and I enjoyed it. And I do enjoy it. Um, you know, pharmacy and medicine in general. Um, so a lot of research went into looking at all of the different aspects and fields that, that you can explore in medicine. Um, and I quickly realized that, you know, general surgery, although, you know, they operate on, you know, you know mostly the abdomen and, you know, actually for, they can operate real, real anywhere in the body, but um, they also um, have a heavy education in medicine and, and manage their patients, um, you know, very sick and complicated patients postoperatively too. Um, they manage their entire patient. So that is what really drew me to general surgery um, is, you know, not only the, the challenge of, uh, of surgery, learning the dexterity and the different techniques of surgery, but also, um, you know, the extensive medical education you get in a surgical residency um, that probably a lot of people, yeah, aren't aware of, just like you said, but um, that's certainly, you know, not the case. I would say general surgery has a lot of medicine involved in it. Yeah, that's that's something that's super reassuring to hear as well, just because I, I haven't been in an OR yet. So I'm very excited to, to start out, like I mentioned, this summer. But I was a little nervous. You know, what happens if I fall in love with this? Am I going to completely forego my pharmacy education? And that's that's good to hear that uh, that's not the case. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, if you couldn't be a surgeon, what other specialty would you have considered? Was anesthesia ever on the table at some point? I know that has a, a strong pharmacy background. Uh, were there other things you know, that you had as your second or third line that you were curious about? So anesthesia was one of the first fields I looked at, um, just for the reason you said. Um, and I, I liked it. I, I think and the field of anesthesia is very interesting. Uh, you're still in the operating room, too. So, um, and, um, but I would say... I, I looked at every single field, everything you could do um, in a, in a, for a medical profession. Um, and um, I, I just, I came down to, to loving the field of general surgery. Um, but there's an old adage they, they say in medicine um, where they say you shouldn't become a surgeon unless 
you don't like anything else because the training can be grueling, the hours are long. Um, so I don't find that's the case at all. I don't. I think that's probably an outdated um, saying. Um, it's definitely, I wouldn't base any of your decision-making uh, based off that at all. Um, that's kind of, kind of, yeah, where I am with it, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great to hear because uh, that's kind of a, like an antiquated, you know, saying that, oh, if you don't, you know, if you're not in, totally in love with surgery, then you're going to have a miserable time because of the, the reputation of having long, horrible hours. And we'll, we'll unpack some of that and we'll have you potentially debunk some of these myths or just give it to us straight. But um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about residency then. Uh, let's take some time to explore the surgical theater and what it takes to survive in a surgical residency. The field certainly, like I said, has a reputation for long hours and many sleepless nights. So what has it been like for you, you know, if, now that you're coming towards the end of that, that period of training? So I would, you know, I'd say all residency is hard, um, regardless of the profession that, or the um, specialty that you choose. Uh, but yeah, I would, it's probably still true that surgical residency is harder than most others. Um, but for me, I can tell you that it's been a pleasant surprise. Um, uh, you know, the hours are strictly regulated by the ACGME. And uh, I would say, you know, most, if not all, um, surgical residencies strictly abide by these. Um, so um, I don't think hours are much of an issue, at least they're not for me. Um, I was, didn't really have to give up really anything in my life. You know, I, I'm married, I have a wife, I get to spend a lot of time with her and my family. Uh, we own a home with a big yard and a dog. Um, so you could still have a normal life as a surgical resident. Um, um, and I, I, I feel like I really haven't given anything up at all. Um, what, what else did you ask Nathan about it? Oh, no, you, you answered the question right there. And I can kind of spin it uh, into our next question, which was, um, you know, for, for actually for our audience first, for those of you who don't know, general surgery residency begins after the completion of medical school, obviously, and it lasts five years. So I'm, my question for you is, I'm curious to know which years were the most challenging, which ones were the most enjoyable? Could you just walk us through maybe the last five years, just at a, you know, bird's eye view? Sure, sure. I, I would say it's five years at a minimum. Um, there are uh, a lot of programs out there that incorporate research. Um, some, some programs between, you know, one and three additional years of research are built into your training. Um, so it's, it, it is five years at a minimum. Um, but in terms of, you know, a brief overview of, of what it's like, I, I would say that the hardest time I had during my training um, was my first month as an intern. I started uh, off on the trauma service and, um, you know, where I train, it's a very busy trauma service um, with a, you know, um, you know, a very robust patient census. Um, so it is a um, very difficult adjustment to make um, from medical school um, to residency where you are cert you're given a, a large amount of responsibility um, and you have to quickly learn how to apply all the nerve, the knowledge that you gain in, um, in medical school to taking care of patients. Um, and that's a hard transition to make. Um, I think regardless of what specialty you, you choose from, uh, you, that, that, you, that you choose. Um, yeah. In terms of the other years of training, um, you know, um, as you become more senior through a surgical residency, um, your, um, your operative experience changes dramatically. Um, your, what's expected of you in the operating room um, from the attending surgeons changes. You're expected, uh, you know, to be able to do more in the operations, to be more autonomous. And usually by the time, um, you know, you're a fourth year resident, and especially while, when you're a chief resident, um, you should be able to do the majority of the bread and butter operations on your own. Um, so that's kind of how it works. Um, as you tra transition more as a more senior surgical resident, um, you operate a lot more. Awesome. And that kind of transitions nicely into our next question, too, was, is that, you know, can you walk me through your your average day on the job? You know, what time do you start? When do you normally finish? How many procedures do you end up doing per day? I'm just kind of curious to get, you know, some more information on that. Sure. It, it really would change uh, depending on what service you're on. Uh, I mean, so general surgery, you, you rotate through, like, you know, trauma surgery, all of the abdominal um, subspecialties that you could choose from, um, critical care medicine as well. But I would say for an average day, uh, most of our residents show up around 5 a.m. and uh, they look at patient charts pre-round and then um, their team meets and they round with the attending surgeon. And then usually around seven o'clock, 
or 7.30, um, the teams uh, will divide up cases. Um, usually that's the senior resident's responsibility, and then they'll go to the operating room. Um, and that, that can vary, uh, the types of cases you do depending on what service you're on. But generally it's, you know, maybe around, you know, four to five cases a day, or maybe, you know, one or two big cases per day. Um, and you usually finish up in the operating room, um, you know, in the late afternoon. Uh, you finish up and see any consults that maybe you have uh, during the day, you follow up on any labs or any, um, any imaging that you ordered in any of your patients. And then typically the day ends around 5 p.m. Um, and people go home uh, and, then, and then a call team takes over. So that's the, the, the typical day in surgery. Um, uh, it's different, like if you're on a trauma service, you know, you're expected to go down and, and evaluate all the traumas that come into the hospital throughout the day. But I'd say, you know, what I, what I said at first is it's kind of a typical day in a surgical residency. Okay. And with trauma, if an individual was interested in doing like a trauma, um, I guess, becoming a trauma surgeon, they would have to do a fellowship in that afterwards, despite having exposure to it during general surgery. Is that correct? Uh, not, uh, not entirely correct. You could, you know, become a, you could be a trauma surgeon without a fellowship. Um, but um, a, a lot of people that do want to be in the field of trauma um, do pursue additional training in it. And actually the, the training is surgical critical care. Uh, okay. which is one to two years. And um, that is usually um, the pathway that a lot of people do for trauma surgery. Just to fine tune everything and to get a little bit more experience under their belt before they are, are thrown to the wolves as an attending. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. But um, your surgical residency, um, trauma is a heavy focus on it. So you get extensive training uh, during your general surgery residency for that. Wonderful. Um, so my next question was you, you kind of, prefaced it a little bit in your previous answer, but how frequently are you on call? You said it's very dependent on, you know, what service you're, you're serving at the time period, but how frequently are you on call on a general per year? And you know, how, how long are those shifts on, depending on, let's say, worst case scenario and then maybe best case scenario? Sure. Uh, well, uh, I'll start by saying there are two different types of call that uh, most programs do and we do where I train. Um, number one, uh, the first one is in-house call where you, know, you're, you stay in the hospital uh, overnight. And, a, a second, and the other one is um, in a home call where you, know, you can go home, sleep in your own bed, uh, but you have to be available to field any you know, questions from any of the other physicians, nurses. Uh, you may have to drive back into the hospital to see consults or if there's an emergency operation that needs done. So those are the two general types of call. In terms of in-house call, um, you, you know, your day would start at, again at 5 a.m. like most days start, uh, but um, Instead of your shift ending at 5 p.m., you, you, you would stay um, overnight uh, and take another 12-hour shift, essentially, from you know, 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. Um, so that's kind of how that call shift would work. Um, early on in your training, um, like maybe during your first year or so, um, at least where I train, your call is a little bit lighter. We take around three to four calls per month. Um, as you can become more senior in terms of in-house call, um, take around maybe five to six calls a month, which averages out to maybe one in five or six days. Um, and um, the, the day after your call, uh, the day after your in-house call, we call it a post-call day where you're free of all clinical responsibilities. So a lot of us take a nap, you know, uh, wake up in the afternoon and kind of have the day off after that. So um, use it. You can use it however you want to catch up on, you know, life activities, study, um, spend time with family. But um that's generally how a lot of programs handle call responsibility. Interesting. Th thanks for that. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know also, just based off of like your experience, I know or pharmacists are getting more and more involved in the clinical realm. <clears throat> and based off of your day to day, you said you mentioned that you're in the OR for a good amount of time, but you're also doing a lot of clinic or a lot of um, rounding on the hospital wards to, to do follow-up on uh, post-operative care. I'm curious to know, do you have a lot of interaction with hospital pharmacists and what has that been like for you, especially with your extensive uh, pharmacy training in the background? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, as, as surgical residents, yeah, we, we do have quite a bit of interaction with um, hospital pharmacists. So the hospital staff pharmacists, especially early on in your training, um, you know, when you're first getting used to, you know, putting in orders for patients, uh, they'll become your best friends because uh, a lot of the, the newly, uh, the new interns will, will call them for, you know, dosing of certain medications, uh, you know, antibiotic dosing or even choosing the appropriate antibiotic. 
Um, and then the clinical pharmacists will, um, will round with uh, some of the surgical teams and especially the ICU team. So we have a dedicated trauma clinical pharmacist that rounds with us that we have lots of interaction with and provides education for our, um, you know, our residents and um, the whole surgical staff. So um, me being a pharmacist, you know, it was an easy icebreaker to meet everyone. Um, and um, yeah, it certainly helped um, um, make new, establish new relationships without a doubt. Wonderful. And one of, uh, we have a couple more questions before we switch over to fellowship, but um, I'm curious to know, you know, as a chief resident, how are your responsibilities different from previous years and how has this role prepared you to become a, a future attending? Do you feel far more prepared? Do you, you know, feel comfortable in the position that you're in right now? Uh, so uh, as a chief resident, yeah, you, your responsibilities are a little bit different. Uh, you have a lot of administrative responsibilities um, and uh, a lot of educational responsibilities. So we generally, as chief residents, we help um, teach and walk junior residents through, uh, through some of the, the operations. Um, we, uh, can, we teach and lecture on certain surgical topics. Um, and then in terms of the administration, you know, we usually make the call schedule, assign the OR cases, um, handle any, any issues in terms of, um, you know, for the general residency and act as just leaders um, for our residency department. Um, and uh, this chief resident role uh, really does help prepare you for um, your, um, your final job as an attendant because we also run our own, you know, chief resident clinic, you know, see our own patients, book our own cases. Um, and I have to say that, you know, you know, when I look back at when I was an intern um, and where I am now, I, I thought when I first started, I, I don't know how, I didn't know how I was going to be able to learn all these operations with all these different approaches in terms of, you know, laparoscopic surgery, robotic surgery, endoscopy, open surgery, all the different approaches and all the dexterity and, and that you have to learn with your hands. I, I didn't think I'd ever get there, but, you know, I think my advice to people that go into the field would just, just trust the process. Um, because, you know, once I hit my chief resident year, I, I, I look back, I'm like, wow, I, I'm very comfortable with all this stuff now. So the process works. Uh, all you have to do is trust it. Awesome. And, and lastly, as chief, I'm confident that you're involved in the residency selection process. I'm curious to know what you look for in medical students who are applying to general surgery residency and how important is a research background compared to just like raw skill on, let's say a sub eye or something along those lines? Uh, so um, yeah, we definitely are uh, involved in the residency, residency selection process. Um, uh, I'll answer your, your, your last question first. So the, the raw skill thing, we, we certainly do notice it. Um, you know, if somebody has a, a specific, you know, or have, has, you know, great dexterity or, you know, they're, they're very good with their hands or hand-eye coordination is great in the operating room. Uh, it's certainly something that, you know, we may take into account. It's not a big factor in our selection process because a lot of this stuff is learned. So I'll just give you an example for me in particular. I, I didn't have any specific, um, you know, natural talents or anything along those lines. Uh, so I came in the residency, you know, pretty raw. Um, and, you know, all of this stuff can be learned. So it's not a huge factor for that. So I, uh, um, the other thing we look for is, you know, Obviously, you know, academics, how they do on their surgical uh, subspecialties, um, you know, we try to gauge their interest in surgery. And then, you know, one of the, you know, another important factor is, you know, their location, or what they like to live in this area. Because, you know, surgical residency is long. It's five to seven years of training, depending on where you go. Um, so we have to make sure they, that they would be happy, um, you know, living in this area and they would fit in well with, you know, you know our attendings and our, our other residents. So, um, we the research thing. Uh, it we certainly um, use look at that as a as a big pro um, because you are expected to do research while you're in residency, and um, certainly um, a lot of the hospitals you look for uh, attending jobs are going to expect you to do research too when you're done. So um, it it is a factor that we take uh, take into effect whenever we uh, whenever we uh, when we rank our um, our list. Awesome. All righty. So let's take a few minutes and discuss fellowships now. So I know you've mentioned that you're continuing your training as a fellow in cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, first of all, I want to say you, you must be pretty crazy because I know that's hands down one of the hardest, if not most challenging undertakings in medicine. So congrats and kudos to you. Um, I take it you really love uh, cardiac anatomy, but um, why did you choose CT surgery? 
so yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's a, it, it is a challenging field, uh, but I'd say it's maybe one of the most dynamic fields of all of medicine. Um, uh, so I, I'll start off by saying, so CT surgery in general, uh, yeah, you, whenever you do your fellowship, you get trained in, you know, usually it, it's congenital cardiac, adult cardiac, and adult thoracic surgery. Those are the three, you know, big pillars of, uh, of CT surgery training. Um, but a lot of surgeons usually branch off into one of th those, those three. They, they focus on thoracic surgery, which is essentially you know, thoracic oncology and foregut surgery, um, cardiac surgery or, or adult cardiac surgery or the congenital cardiac surgery. Um, so a lot of surgeons will, will focus on one of those three. Um, so me in particular, I'm interested in, in thoracic surgery. Um, that's likely what I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, most of my focus on. And um, the reason why how I got interested in it is through general surgery. Um, so we do a lot of training in uh, foregut surgery, like things like anti-reflux surgery for people that have um, GERD, um, esophageal motility disorder surgery, um, <laughs> Uh, esophageal cancer, um, lung cancer, and all the benign diseases of the lung. Um, and a lot of the skills that you learn in general surgery directly translate over that. Um, so general surgery, um, get extensive training in minimally invasive on laparoscopic surgery. And um, a lot of those skills translate directly over the thoracic surgery. So it's a natural transition. Um, um, so it's, yeah, it's, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a big challenge, um, but I, I, I've, um, I couldn't be happier doing, doing this field. Yeah, and I, I love that you kind of like stratified it into the, the big three. I'm curious to know, is transplant one of those or does that fall under some of those, um, one of those big three options there or is that a separate transplant surgery that focuses on, I'm, I'm referring more so to like cardiac transplant or lung transplant. Sure. No, sure, sure. It's not, uh, you know, generally one of the three pillars, but yes, if you want to be a, if you want to transplant, be a transplant surgeon for heart and lungs, um, yeah, you would, you would need to complete a um, fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery or an integrated, um, you know, cardiothoracic residency. And then most of them, although it's not required, most Purdue do an additional one year in transplant surgery. Wow. That's, that's crazy long. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is. So as a, as a CT surgeon, you know, I, a lot of these surgeries I can imagine are a little more complex or can be per se um, when it, like with, when it comes to like timing and time spent in the OR and post-operative follow-up. So do you anticipate you're going to be in the OR for longer versus let's say your residency training, which might've had a better balance between clinic post-op and OR time? Yeah, it, it is a little different. Um, so like, for a um, general thoracic surgeon, um, you know, that focuses on thoracic oncology, um, their bread and butter operations are going to be lung resections, uh, like lobectomies, segmentectomies, pneumonectomies. Um, and a lot of uh, thoracic surgeons operate on the foregut, so they do esophagectomies. Um, I can tell you that an esophagectomy is a long operation, uh, especially if it's done minimally invasively. It could take upwards to eight or 12 hours. So, you know, you do have a, a long day in the operating room. Um, but a lot of thoracic surgeons um, also have, you know, smaller cases too. Um, so a lot of them do advanced endoscopy, um, like, you know, EGDs, dilations. Mm -hmm. um, they do, um, you know, bronchoscopy, NAB bronchoscopy, endobronchial ultrasound, which are smaller procedures. Uh, so there's a big, there's a, there's a nice mix of longer procedures and, and smaller procedures. Um, but like all surgeons, they, they do have responsibilities in the clinic. So um, they see their patients, you know, uh, postoperatively. Um, Usually they have about a day or a day and a half of clinic per week. And I'm curious to know, as an aside, what's like the longest surgery that you've ever scrubbed in for and were participating or leading? Uh, I'd say um, liver transplants can be, can be very long. Um, you know, I, I maybe around the 12 hour mark or so. Um, but yeah, I'd say uh, esophageal perforations, uh, depending on how you manage that perforation. But uh, sometimes when we um, we resect the esophagus and exclude it to the neck, um, that could be a long one. Um, and and and, a, and an esophagectomy again, depending on you know obviously a patient's anatomy, uh, whether they got preoperative chemo radiation therapy, uh, where it can make the um, your dissection planes you know very difficult. You know that operation can, like I said, take upwards to eight or, eight or twelve hours. So yeah, that's you can have long days, no no doubt about it. <laughs> And 
kind of building off of that as well, I, I anticipate that your work-life balance is going to suffer a little bit just based off of the reputation of CT surgery and the training that goes into it. How are you planning to maintain some semblance of a life outside of the OR? Uh, so just like um, general surgery, uh, residency, uh, thoracic surgery, um, or CT surgery fellowship is a ACGME accredited fellowship. So um, work hours are strict. And um, so there's an 80 hour work week role that um, all residencies and all ACGME accredited residency fellowships uh, follow. Um, so I don't anticipate that um, it will be uh, much different, um, but um, I certainly will expect that um, I'm going to have other challenges in terms of, you know, learning an entire new field. So, um, but work-life balance, I don't anticipate being a much, much of an issue. Well, that's definitely reassuring then. Um, and kind of, you know, building off that even further, I know that healthcare burnout is a major issue. It just in you know, all different fields of healthcare, whether it's pharmacy, medicine, nursing, um, you know, longer work hours, short staffing, declining reimbursement, and, you know, limited PPE, especially during the, the COVID pandemic, has only made, you know, burnout worse. Do you think healthcare professionals as a whole, or I guess, how do you think healthcare professionals as a whole can combat burnout and maintain job satisfaction? That's a really good question, and I know it's it's discussed quite a bit in the, in the field of medicine. Um, but I think you know um, the big thing for burnout is um, you know choosing the field you love, um, and um, you know making making sure that you enjoy what you do, and and then you know um, probably I I would say if you kind of nurture um, an environment that's collegial, friendly, um, and um, supportive, um, that's I think a great way to combat physician burnout. So, especially in terms of residency training, um, if you have, you know, your leadership up top that promotes, you know, a, you know, a friendly environment like that, um, I think it really, um, uh, you know, decreases physician burnout quite a bit. I love that. Um, so let's take a few minutes. Uh, I know we're getting through the episode and we're getting close to the end. But uh, let's take a few minutes and discuss this Pharmacy Times article that will be linked in the description below eventually. But let's the article discusses pharmacist provider status. And I think it's just something interesting, especially with your pharmacy background, that we could you know, briefly chat about. And so this was a report from 2019. So I know it's a little dated by the AAMC that was predicting that there would be a, short, a physician shortfall of up to 139,000 by the 2033. With this in mind, do you think pharmacist provider status should be explored a little more to help alleviate some of the primary care shortages? Yeah, I'm surprised that you know it took this long to talk about this. Um, I remember I think I was thinking about this when I was in pharmacy school, and I briefly looked into it. And I believe at the time, I, maybe a few states had a uh, an avenue for a pharmacist to become a prescriber. Um, but I think this is a great idea. Um, I mean, if you think about it, you know, pharmacists are you know, readily available and uh, they have the training and the knowledge. Um, and I think it would be a very good solution um, to the physician shortage in primary care. Absolutely. W wonderful. Yeah, I, I think we're definitely a little biased based off of our background, but, um, you know, I think we have a sound footing to advocate for, you know, pharmacists to you know, expand their role in healthcare, especially in these areas that are lacking a lot of uh, resources. And I'd also argue, you know, that because of the advanced clinical residency training that a lot of pharmacists are undergoing, it's no longer just one year, it's two years. And I've even heard rumors of a three-year uh, post-graduation residency program. Um, so with all this additional training, it's hard to think that, you know, how are they, how are these pharmacists exiting these fields and still not having the ability to prescribe medications? And I think that, that could be resolved with potentially adjusting the, the pharmacy school curriculum a little bit to focus more on diagnostics, because I know that's something that is missed, uh, or I guess is looked away because of the focus on, you know, training and optimizing care with medications. So I think it's just an interesting uh, observation, I would say, especially there, I think it would be cool to see a residency program that maybe it was just a, a prescriber program or something along those lines of one one year residency training in just prescriptive medicine for 
some diseases focus more on like chronic conditions. I, I think that'd be really cool. Any thoughts on that? No, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, I, I do think, you know, um, it probably wouldn't be hard to make a few adjustments to the curriculum for pharmacy school um, to include, um, you know, more of a, like a, a, um, like a clinical therapeutics course. Um, um, and yeah, even the, the, the postgraduate training for residency, I, I think that's a good idea what you brought up. Um, so, you know, really have a, you know, a clinical base, um, you know, residency where pharmacists are, pharmacists are exposed to, you know, prescribing medications, following patients, you know, you know, longitudinally like that. I think it's a great idea. Fantastic. Well, we are coming to the final few minutes of our show today, and I just want to ask you a few closing questions. So medicine is always changing and new technology or medications continue to advance clinical outcomes. Are there any innovations in surgery or medical care on the horizon that excite you? Yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll say two things. Um, in terms of surgery, I, I, although it's probably not new anymore, uh, but the field of robotic surgery, uh, I think it's very exciting. Um, and, um, you know, it makes a lot of the procedures that we do um, easier um, for the surgeon. Um, and some of the preliminary studies that we have, um, even better for the patients too. So um, robotics is, is, I think, very exciting. Um, and the applications of robotic surgery, are, I think, are going to continue to grow. It's going to be more ubiquitous in the field of surgery um, as a whole. Um, also, I, I would say in terms of, you know, um, oncology, I, I'd say the field of targeted immunotherapy is, is very exciting and what it can do for cancer patients. So I really look forward to see uh, what, what's going to happen with that as well. Yeah, let's unpack some of that um, robotic surgery real quick. I, I just wanted to comment and say that it, I think it's going to be crazy and maybe not within the next 10 years, but within the next maybe 20, 30 years, you know, the surgeon will be able to just go down to their basement, log in and, you know, perform the surgery right there across the, across the world. So I, I know that's, that's probably a little far-fetched, but I, I think that's something that could be, you know, a possibility on the line. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I, I think we're already there. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's happened. Um, I, I don't, I don't know how, how common it is, but um, I, I know it, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure at least that um, remote, these remote types of surgeries have happened, um, especially if they were maybe consulted in or for training purposes. Um, but we have the technology for it right now. Wow, that's incredible. And you said it's a little bit easier for surgeons as well. Is it because of a lot of the, the sensitivity of the controls can be adjusted. So a one inch movement is really one millimeter that's perfectly proportioned out through the computer software or versus like a handheld uh, traditional surgery. I, I'd say uh, compared to um, like minimally invasive, let's say if you're comparing laparoscopic to um, robotic surgery, um, you're in terms of robotic surgery, the instruments that you're controlling are wristed. So you have you know, more degrees of freedom inside the body cavity. Um, also, you're, um, you know, you have a, a greater depth of field with the camera you use in robotic surgery. Um, and I'd say, uh, at least at least with my experience and talking to some of the, you know, the other residents and surgeons that I know is that, um, you know, the, 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 I'd say the learning curve is not quite as steep with robotics as compared with laparoscopic surgery. Um, laparoscopic surgery can be difficult to learn. Um, and I think robotics may be a little bit, a little bit easier and quicker to pick up on. Absolutely. And it definitely could be something that is super easy to train future residents on because they can just go to a, a clinical simulation lab versus working on cadavers or, or something like that. So right. I, I think that's really cool. Um, additionally, I was curious to know, do you have a perfect surgery or a surgery that you absolutely love doing? What one of those surgeries where you hear about it, it's on the OR and you claim it immediately. Uh, it's on the OR list. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll tell you too. Like, so one is, um, you know, I'm going to be a, you know, a thoracic surgeon. So um, I love a minimally invasive esophagectomy. I, I don't. Want, I probably scared a few listeners away when I said how long the operation was, but <laughs> it's it's um it, it's un, it's unbelievable. You you we we set the esophagus. Uh, we do it minimally invasively. Um, and you're working in the abdomen to, you know, mobilize the, the stomach and, and you make a, a, a new esophagus from the stomach, um, a neoesophagus where you, you staple off the stomach to make a new conduit. 
Um, and then you flip the patient over on their side and you operate in the, in the thorax, the chest, and you mobilize the esophagus off the heart, off the, you know, off the, off the lungs, off the spine, um, and you completely remove it. And then you bring up your new conduit, the stomach that you made, and you connect it with the cervical esophagus. Um, so, you know, that feat is unbelievable to me. And, um, and it's generally done, well, not, not exclusively done, but it's generally done for cancer. So, um, you know, you have the, the potential to really prolong someone's life. Um, and then the other operation I'll mention um, in the field of general surgery, I, don't, I think that there's probably nothing more exciting than a trauma laparotomy. Um, so, you know, somebody that comes in, you know, as a level one trauma activation with, a, let's say, a gunshot wound in the abdomen, um, that is, you know, you know, hemodynamically unstable down in the emergency department. It's our job to get those patients up to the operating room as quickly as possible. Um, and um, we do a, a midline incision and open up the ad uh, and quickly try to diagnose and fix the problem. Um, so any, just imagine anything in the abdominal cavity could be injured from you know, the abdominal aorta to the liver, to the spleen, to the small bowel. Um, and it's up to the trauma surgeon to, to be able to, you know, quickly fix those things, to save that patient's life. It's extremely exhilarating and rewarding. Um, so those, those, Although they're two vastly different operations, those, those are the two that uh, I get really excited for. Wow, that, that's incredible. <laughs> you're, you're making me uh, super excited to, to explore general surgery in the future. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so uh, last couple of questions here. So for individuals considering medical school after pharma pharmacy school, what are some things you would share with them based on your experience thus far? So I'd say... Um, it's another financial commitment. So you do have to take that into consideration. Um, so I always say like, you know, I, um, if pharmacy school wasn't cheap for me, um, and you know, medical school is expensive too. So you do have to, you know, take that into consideration that, you know, you are going to undergo, um, you know, a significant amount more debt. Um, it is a time investment too, because, you know, medical school is four years and residency training is at least three years long. Um, but you know, if it's truly what you want to do, I wouldn't let any of that stop you because I don't look back at anything that I did. At, um, and I, I, I would have done it all over again. Um, so um, I'd say if you do think you have an interest, um, talk to other physicians, um, but talk to people like us. So there's probably not a lot of people out there that have done both. Um, and if truly what you want to do, I wouldn't let anything stop you. I love that. And I the financial information is, is such a, a good point to bring up too, because that's probably the number one reason a lot of people reach out to me and say, oh, I, I can't do this though. Like, I really want to go to medical school, but the finances, I can't justify turning down a six-figure salary with all these yeah. pharmacy loans. Um, so I, I help them like talk through some of those situations and you have to think about, you know, the, the long-term upside of doing that. And I definitely still have pl plenty of loans from pharmacy school. So um, no, no silver spoon here, but it's just a, an interesting, you know, thing that needs to be brought up and addressed. But like you said, you, you have to follow your passion. It's, it's way better to, to go on and pursue the career ambition, whatever it is, um, versus burning out in a, a field that you might not be 100% passionate about 10 years down the line. I think that's great advice. So as an attending, do you plan on precepting pharmacy students along with medical students? Yes, I'd, I'd love to. Um, I'd certainly be open to it, and I'd encourage pharmacy students to, you know, you know certainly rotate with me when I, when I am an attending. Um, I love to teach, um, and I think there's a lot to be gained uh, for them to rotate on a CT surgery service. Yeah, even just getting that that one OR exposure that was so influential in your decision to to switch into medicine might be, you know, exactly what one or two pharmacy students, you know, every single year needs to see to you know, open their eyes to something that they weren't su super aware about. So I, I love that. Yeah. And we could use their help. Uh, a lot of patients are on, you know, vasopressors, you know, um, complicated antibiotic regimens um, and they're, or even the ones that aren't quite as acute, they have an extensive medication history. So uh, we could certainly use their help too. Wonderful. Alrighty, so we have come to the end of our interview, and I'd like to thank all of our listeners for their attention and interest in medicine. If you have additional questions about the medical school journey, check out my website, www.physicianpharmacist.com. Before we let you go, Dr. Melvin, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, probably the best way is email. Um, good. My email is tjm865 at gmail. Um, 
shoot me an email and I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to get back to you. All righty. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us today and best of luck with your training. I look forward to, to keeping in touch and hearing about all of your tremendous success in surgery. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Dave. All right. I appreciate it. Have a great week. You too.